seeking the light of God's spirit and his word. We turn to the Old Testament scriptures, to the book of Exodus once more, as we continue our studies together in the tabernacle. book of Exodus, and we find ourselves tonight in chapter 26. Exodus and chapter 26, and we're going to, um, I'm going to read from verse 31. Exodus 26, and at verse 31, and thou shalt rear up the tabernacle, I think I'm reading in verse 30, but it doesn't matter. Actually, verse 30 is, is a better point to read it from. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet, and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it on four pillars of sheet and wood overlaid with gold, their books shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. Thou shalt hang up the veil under the touches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy place. The veil shall divide between the holy place and the most holy place. Well, we um, have now been many, many weeks together considering the tabernacle. We began in the courtyard. We saw the altar of burnt offering and the labor. Then we moved into the first part of the building, if we can call it that the holy place, and we saw the three items of furniture in the holy place. As a priest would enter, and only a priest could enter, as a priest would enter, he would see on his right the table with showbread and the 12 loaves, which is actually referred to in our chapter in Mark on the Lord's Day morning, you might remember. So on his right hand side, there's the table with the showbread and the 12 loaves. On his left is the lampstand. And directly in front of him was the altar of incense, which we considered last week. Now behind the altar of incense lay the second part of the building. And that part was called the Holy of Holies or the most holy place because it was the most holy place that the first part that we've already been in was the holy place but this is the most holy place and that's where our consideration of this whole structure must now take us but as we step towards it as we go towards the most holy place we realize that the opening that is there is covered by a thick curtain. And I mean a very thick curtain. And we've just read about that in verses 31 to 33 there. And tonight, before we venture into the most holy place, if we're spared next Wednesday, we will venture into it. But tonight, before we venture into it, I want us to consider this curtain that hung there between the two. And I want to focus on four things about this curtain. But first of all, a brief description of the curtain. It hung, as we saw in our reading there, on golden chains from above, and I'll mention that later on. 
It was made of fine twined linen that spoke of excellence and beauty. But although it was fine twined linen, it wasn't a thin, insubstantial covering. It was the very opposite. It was a very substantial curtain indeed. We're told in verse um, 31 that it was embroidered and that the embroidery showed up cherubims. Now cherubims, as you know, are a rank of angels and there were cherubims on the curtain. We'll see why in a minute. And the colors that were used, you had the white, obviously, of the fine linen itself. But you also were told in the verse there, there was scarlet, blue, and purple. Now, I've, I've spoken at length about these colors. I'm not going to go into it at all just now. The white reminded them of the sinless, holy purity of God. The other colors, we believe, spoke of heaven, spoke of the cross, spoke of the throne. It's all there if we have but eyes to see it. But putting all that to one side, I want us now to look at four things about this curtain. And I want us to notice, first of all, that this curtain concealed. This curtain concealed. It hid certain things. Now, curtains often do that. You draw the curtains in the house sometimes just for a bit of privacy to, to be inside. Well, this curtain too, it was there to conceal. It wasn't a glass door that stood before between the holy place and the most holy place so that standing in the holy place, you could peer in and, and look and see what was in there. It wasn't a glass door. It wasn't an open entrance. It was this thick, heavy curtain and it hid everything that lay in the holy of holies and no one I should say was permitted to have a look beyond that curtain only one person will see who in a moment was allowed in but it hid everything that lay behind it now the apostle Paul writing to the Hebrews tells us that that curtain that hid everything behind it was quite symbolic. Hebrews 9 verse 8. He tells us there that in this way, the Holy Ghost was showing us that the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest while the tabernacle was still standing. In other words, we're still in the Old Testament. And there is much that is not revealed. Much that was not shown them. Now you know, and I've made this point often enough, that God's revelation is gradual. He reveals certain things to Adam and Eve. He doesn't reveal everything to them. They couldn't have taken everything in. He told them a little. And then gradually, bit by bit, each generation finds out a little more until eventually we come to the coming of Christ and the grand revelation that comes with the New Testament. But the apostle is saying that thick, heavy curtain was a way of God showing that there was still much that wasn't known, much that wasn't revealed, much that was still out of their sight and beyond their understanding. The obscurity of the Old Testament that would have to wait for the New Testament and the coming of Christ. Now, I don't know if we're as thankful as we should be that we live in New Testament days. I'm not disparaging the Old Testament, not for a moment. And the Lord blessed to them the life they had, I know. But at the same time, it is surely a greater blessing to live in days when the gospel is made known in a way that it simply wasn't in the Old Testament. They had signs and symbols, 
we have in large part all of that fulfilled. They were looking ahead vaguely to Christ and putting their hope in him. What revelation we have of him. And how much the more should our faith be strong enough? How much the more should our hearts be thankful for what we have in him? If they were thankful for what they had, how much more should we, with the great revelation we have? We have, we have the word of God itself. Old and New Testament. Old Testament believers didn't have that. The most they had was parts of the old. Some of them didn't even have that before the canon of scripture came together. The Lord blessed them. Of course he did. He made up for these things in different ways. Absolutely. But we should be the more diligent, the more faithful, and the more thankful. So the curtain concealed. It was God's way of saying lots of things not known yet. But then we read in the next chapter in Hebrews something else. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, we read these words. That Jesus has gone into the holiest by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil. Now the veil there means the curtain. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. See, Apostle saying that. Well, he's telling us that that curtain, and this is not an easy concept perhaps to grasp, but it's a very rewarding one once you do grasp it. That curtain was also a symbol of Christ's human nature. And I'm going to come back to this in my fourth point. So, Hold on to it, as it were, in your mind. But it was a symbol of Christ's human nature. While the Lord was in this world, his human nature covered and concealed a great deal. His divine nature wasn't on open display. It couldn't be. It would have been impossible for him to live and minister if his divine nature had been on open display. The few occasions when a glimpse of it is given, everybody is overcome. In the garden, for instance, when they come to arrest him. For a moment, his divine nature is, I, I, I am he, he says, and they fall over. And he has to wait while they pick themselves up. On the Mount of Transfiguration, three disciples get a glimpse of it as well. And there are other occasions, I know. But for the vast, vast majority of the time, he moved among men and women. And he lived in this world with his true humanity. And that was a veil, a covering, if you like, for the glory and the dignity of his divine person. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not, for most of them. He was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the Galilean. Although some saw behind the curtain and saw a glimpse of the Son of God. Nathaniel catches a glimpse of it there, doesn't he? When you were under the fig tree, I saw him. And he catches a glimpse and Mary, oh, Mary caught many a glimpse of it. God's been here, my brother had not died. But I mustn't go down that road just now. But um, the, hum the, the, na the human, the body of Christ, the human nature of Christ was also symbolized by the curtain. Now I'm going to come back to that because there's something crucial about that that we'll see in our fourth point. So the curtain, it concealed. But the curtain did more than conceal. The curtain also prohibited. You know the signs that you see in some places 
No access except for authorized personnel. That's what that curtain said. No access except for authorized personnel. There was no open day in the tabernacle when you could wander in and lift the heavy curtain and go into the holy place, the most holy place. It said no access in here. It closed off access to the holy of holies and to the ark of the covenant that was in there. Now we're going to come to the ark next week. And we'll see that in the ark, above the ark, above the mercy seat, as we'll see next week, God was present in a very special way. Now God is present everywhere. But he shows himself present in a special way at times in certain places. And he did that with the Ark of the Covenant. The Shekinah glory, and we'll see more of that later on. But that was there in the most holy place. There was God, as it were. And they couldn't come near. The way was closed. That curtain said, there's a distance between yourself and your God. You can't come in here. A symbolic, physical barrier into God's presence because sin had closed the way. And the curtain itself actually had a reminder of that. Do you remember what I said about the embroidery? It was embroidered with cherubims. Now, where do we first meet cherubims? Genesis 3. Man sins, man is expelled from the garden. And the first reference we have to cherubims is in verse 24, where we're told that the cherubim guarded the way with flaming sword. And every time the priests in the holy place saw these cherubim, they were reminded, sin has come, catastrophe has come, and we have no longer access to God or to the tree of life or to anything else. There is a barrier that says, stop where you are and stay there and don't. Come any closer. As far as sinful man is concerned, the way is closed. And it remained closed until in the fullness of time, the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And what does he say? He says, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. In other words, man does come to the Father by me. Now we'll see more of that in a second. But Christ was saying there, the way that was closed, that no access sign is going to come down. But here in the Old Testament, it hadn't come down. But no sooner has Christ finished making the way, as we'll see in a minute, than this curtain was ripped in two. The prohibition is gone. There is a way into the holiest. So the curtain concealed. The curtain prohibited, but thirdly, the curtain permitted. It's a curtain, not a wall. And one person was allowed access on very strict conditions. On one day of the year, the great day of atonement, the high priest of whoever it might happen to be at that time 
would go, he would lift that heavy curtain, and he would go in. Now, we were reminded in Hebrews that he went in with blood. And the blood is sprinkled, as we'll see on the mercy seat next week. He was allowed in. Hebrews 9. It's worth reading a verse or two here just now. When these things were first ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, that's the holy place, accomplishing the service of God. Verse 7, Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. He went in. Nobody ever went in with him. It would have been quite a day for the high priest the first time he went in. First year he was high priest. It must have been something quite remarkable. His father ordinarily would have been high priest before him. His father has died. He's doing all the duties of the high priest. And the great day of atonement comes. What a thought. For the first time ever. He's going to lift that curtain. And he's going to go in. They do say. The Jews were so nervous. They, they, they were so frightened. It occurred to them. that This is an inscription. It's Jewish tradition. But it sounds plausible. That it occurred to them. What if the high priest dies in there? What if he, if he collapses? How do we get him out? He couldn't go in. And Jewish writers say that they, they resorted to tying a rope to his leg. So that if anything happened, they could pull him out. Because they, could, they couldn't go. They didn't dare go in. But he went in. And he went through the curtain. And you know, many writers have suggested that the fact that it was a curtain and not a wall was a hint that one day the curtain would come down. It's here and it's here for the moment. But one day there won't be a curtain anymore. But as high priest after high priest went in, and out over the centuries, the veil was still there. And the Lord was saying, not one of these sacrifices they've come with has opened the way. Not one of these high priests has been the high priest who's going to open the way into the most holy place. Still waiting for another one. Still waiting. Century after century waiting for a better sacrifice and a better high priest. But then Hebrews 9, what does it tell us? Verse 12. Uh, verse 12, yeah. By the, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, Jesus entered in once into the holy place. Oh. Jesus wasn't a priest. He didn't belong to the Levitical priesthood. He didn't go into the holy place in the temple in Jerusalem. He entered into the holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. What holy place? What most holy place did he go into? Well, into heaven itself. That's the most holy place. Into the very presence of God. In the most holy place. With the Shekinah glory above the mercy seat. There was the presence of God. But oh that was but a bare symbol. Of the most holy place above. Where dwelt almighty God. And Christ offers himself. And the sacrifice is given. For his people. He died. 
not to make it possible for the whole world to be saved, but to make it certain, friends, that his people would be saved. He makes his sacrifice. And he goes in once with blood. It's not the blood of bulls and of goats. That had been of no use. But his own blood. And he presents that as it were in the presence of heaven itself. The curtain it concealed, it prohibited. On certain occasions, it permitted. Concealed, it prohibited, it permitted. Fourthly, it dripped, it dripped. That great curtain hung there for hundreds of years. Thousands of priests must have gazed at it as they went about their business in the holy place. They saw the light from the lampstand show up its beauty. They saw the cherubims and they said, oh, well, the presence of God is in there, but we can't go in can't go in. And a fair number of high priests from air on onwards lifted that curtain and went in. But one day it ripped and it wasn't an accident. It wasn't because it had grown old and fusty and a little hole appeared. It ripped. No human hand could have torn that curtain. And nobody would have dared to anyway. On that day, there's the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And his body, which we saw was, a sim was symbolized by the curtain. What happened to it? It was ripped. It was torn. His body was torn. And by his substitutionary death, the way was opened up for sinners to come into God's presence. And in that same moment, that thick curtain wasn't needed anymore. And it ripped open. Matthew 27, 51. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. You notice? Now the top was very high. It wasn't a case of somebody down at the bottom creeping about trying to rip it. It went from the top right down. It was opened from above, you see. Not from below. But from above. What a moment that must have been. We're not told. The, the gospel account doesn't tell us. But they must have been terrified in the temple when it happened. They would have run screaming from the place. Lest they saw what was in there. And died. It was an absolutely extraordinary moment. It signified, among other things, of course, the end of the Old Testament priesthood. It would carry on for a number of years. But it's the beginning of the end. God did this. It was a sign of victory. I think it's Spurgeon who says somewhere that in the East, the tearing of clothes was a sign of mourning. And Spurgeon says it's as if 
The tearing of the curtain was a sign of mourning as Christ died. The, the horror of Calvary captured in that ripping in the ugliness of sin. Now, I leave that with you. I, I, I'm not entirely sure about it, but it's quite a thought in itself. But whether it was a sign of mourning or not, it was certainly a sign of victory. The curtain was gone. It was rendered useless. That curtain spoke of fear. It said, don't come near. But Christ has now died. What does the apostle say? Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter. To enter where? Into the holiest. Having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. You can draw near. Are you drawing near, friend? Come for the way is open. It's for sinners like you. Christ says, come unto me. And the Father says, come unto me. And you say, all oh, the way is closed. And Christ says, no, it's not. I've opened it. The curtain is gone. Revelation and admission has come. And it's not just for one. It's for all the Lord's people. In the Old Testament, it was for one. The New Testament privileges are greater. It's for all the Lord's people. Now, I quoted Spurgeon a moment ago, and I left a weak question mark over it all. But I'm not putting a question mark over this quote from him. Christ's death has opened, he says, a much wider way into God's presence. The rent, the tear, is not in one corner, but in the middle, as Luke tells us. And it's not a little tear through which you might see a little. It is a tear from top to bottom. There is an entrance made for the greatest sinner. Now, says Spurgeon, if there had only been a small hole cut through it, the lesser offender might have crept through. But what an act of mercy is this, that the veil is ripped in the middle from top to bottom, so that even the chief of sinners may find ample passage. When a new road is open, said somebody else, there's often an opening ceremony when the road is set apart or dedicated for its new use. And what happens? Somebody significant or other comes and cuts a tape and all the rest of it and travels it first. When Christ opened this new accessibility into God's presence, he consecrated it with his blood. And he inaugurated it for us by traveling it first ahead of us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, even Jesus. You know, people make the mistake, and I must finish, but people make the mistake of admiring the humanity of Jesus. He was a good teacher, and he was this and that, and he was all of that. Who's going to deny that? But they leave the cross out of it. But the high priest couldn't just admire the curtain and go in. He had to have blood with him when he went in. And so do you.
the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But where the substitute dies, where blood is shed, you can go in. Where the forerunner is entered for you. Now you notice in verse 31, it says that it was made of cunning work. Cunning means skillful, clever. What skill there was designing the way of salvation. Designing the way by which sinners could be saved. What skill? What wisdom? How can we pass through the veil? How can the separation between ourselves and God be taken away? How can we have peace with God in this world and in the world to come? How did the high priest pass through with blood? You're not saved by trying to imitate Christ. Millions make that mistake. If I can just improve my life, you are probably making the same mistake yourself, but once upon a time, if I can just improve my life and be a bit more Christ-like, I'll get in. Oh, you don't go in by trying to imitate Christ. You go in by trusting in him. And you go in with his blood. You don't go in trying to keep rules. You go in through the one who has kept all the rules perfectly. I began by noting that the curtain was held by golden clasps from above. And the Lord Jesus Christ, throughout the entirety of his ministry in this world, was sustained from above. Sustained from above, all the way, until the moment came when the new way was opened into the most holy. And we go in. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Eternal Lord, we praise thy name. That we live in New Testament days. That the curtain that concealed is gone. And now we see, oh, not everything, but we see more than they ever saw. For revelation has reached its fullness. And now sinners are permitted to draw near. The way is open. The curtain has been ripped. His body torn. Torn from the top. But it was the hand of God above all else that sacrificed the Son. Ah, we praise thy name that there is a way opened into the holiest and that we can go into God's presence through Christ. Make him precious to us. Make us thankful for what we have. Enable us by faith to grasp these things. We grant that we would be more zealous, more diligent in the light of what Christ has done for his people. Hear us, hear all that we have petitioned in prayer already. Remember those who are unwell, we leave them in thy care. Go before us now and pardon sin for Jesus' sake. Amen.
going to sing in Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verse 18. I'm going to sing down to verse 20. Okay. Psalm 68 from verse 18. Thou hast, O Lord, most glorious, ascended up on high, and in triumph victorious, led captive captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men, for such as did rebel, yea, even for them, that God the Lord, in midst of them, might dwell, and so on. 18 through 20, thou hast, O Lord, most glorious. the love of God, communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.